entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. The Breeders Academy proudly presents Bread to Perfection with Kenny Troiano. A show for serious breeders. Whether you are looking to create a new strain or simply improve an old one, you have come to the right place. Daddy, I want more chicken. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, here's your host, Kitty Triano. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Bread to Perfection. My name is Kenny Troiano, and this, my friends, is the podcast devoted to helping you become a better breeder and taking your strain to the next level. That's right, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are brand new to breeding or you've been breeding for many years. There is something all of us can do to improve our fowl for future generations. So I say, pray. Who wanted the chicken cross the road? Take it from the left to the right. Right. Hey. Okay, welcome to another episode of Bread Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano, founder of the Breeders Academy, and my hosts, Nancy and Frank Bradley. It's amazing we're even doing the show today because yesterday, Nancy calls me and she goes, there's a fire just up the hill from our house. She shows me a picture of it. I go, oh, that's not too bad. So I wait about an hour and I go out there to take a quick look and it's hot outside, right? Oh my God, the whole hillside is just dark smoke. And it's like, oh, this is not good. So they start sending alerts, and Tani kept rushing in. There, there's an alert. There's an alert. What do we do? What do we do? And I go, I'm not going anywhere until they kick me out. So I sat down and made an evac list of all the things I'm going to take with me just in case. But I just went back to work. Oh, there you go. Well, that's the planes. And then let me see if I find the one with <clears throat> the – oh, yeah. Here, here we go. Yeah, you can kind of see it. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that's just outside my house. And it got worse than that. And by the end of the day, it was gone. Completely gone. We have the best forestry out here with those planes. I didn't think they'd get it out that fast. So we're here. Didn't think we were going to make it, but. I was worried about you guys, but I said, no wonder Kenny's complaining of the heat out there. They're out there stoking the fires outside the house. So. Yeah. <laughs> and the smoke wasn't drowning us out, so we weren't too bad. Although Nancy said she was starting to get it. Yeah, but it stayed up high, so I didn't have to smell smoke. I've had to do that before. It's terrible. It is. Right now, as hot as it is, you don't want to wear a mask. But I tell you, one day here, we was getting the smoke from the Canadian forest fires. Mm -hmm. And I was just about to the point to put on a mask. It was so bad. It was just like a haze, like in the morning time with the fog. Mm -hmm. But it was actual smoke. It, it's just amazing that can come that far up north yeah. and actually have that effect on people here. Yeah. It's something. I was talking to my members. I was doing some coaching calls. I just was appreciative of all the people that are following and supporting our show and especially our members because of them we're able to do what we love to do most and i was just overwhelmed with the gratitude and appreciativeness to everybody who's following us and especially our members and one of the questions i got from somebody they couldn't do the membership right now but they go why don't you do like a patreon page it's like facebook except it's behind a wall and then you pay and it, you basically put on posts or information or videos and then it works like Facebook and every time you put one on there, the rest of them are pushed down to the bottom. And we do everything on the website. And the way I feel about Patreon, it's like Facebook, but with a tip jar. And I just don't feel that's the best format for us because it just feels like you're putting out little bits of information and begging for money. And Frank and I and Nancy, we don't just have a website. We don't just teach breeders. We really put out quality information. We put it out in all formats. We give them the pros, the cons, ins and outs. It's a website just full of information. We're guiding them along the way. We're doing coaching calls. We have master's class videos. And I just didn't feel like Facebook with a tip jar was the way to go. And I've been asked many times, this is why I'm addressing it, just so you guys know, I don't plan on doing Patreon. I never will do Patreon. 
And I just want to let you know that's where we stand on that. So I agree, Kenny. Comparing it to the website, if you're just going to break it up and put pieces on there, it really doesn't work as far as education to the members and the students, per yeah. se. Because the way Kenny's got the website laid out is each part complements the other. And the new members will know exactly what I'm talking about. He's got it set up to start here to where you start a certain area. Because I'm telling you what, even when I first got in there, I'm just going to be honest, I was overwhelmed. And it wasn't I was overwhelmed like, gosh, I'm not going to understand this. I was overwhelmed because I wanted to learn and read as much of those articles as I could because it was answers that I wanted that I was looking for. And that helped me with all the answers and questions that I had as far as being a breeder. And I think to split it up is just doing it injustice. Well, when you joined, we didn't have to start here pages, which changed the game. Right. That really right. organized the website. But could you imagine doing what we're doing with the Breeders Academy on something like Patreon? Yeah. We never be able to accomplish anything. No. It so. would not be beneficial to the members. When you get the whole thing, and once you become a member, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, some stuff, you read an article, and it'll leave you hanging right in the middle of it. The website's not that way. You go in there, and it's got all the stuff that you need to know. And here's the greatest part. It's all science fact. You don't see that on a lot of things. A lot of articles and stuff is people's their own outlook on it, okay? Way Kenny done that, he took scientific data and just downed it to the wording to where it was better understandable because some of that stuff, if he had put it out in its original form and hadn't worded it down, it wouldn't do anybody any good because you wouldn't have been able to understand it. Like I said, I did coaching calls yesterday. And it was neat because the one thing they did say was they really love the way we're doing the show now, this live show. And that we do it for an hour, and then we go on the back end, and we do another hour and a half, sometimes two hours. And we take the conversation to another level, but we tackle the kind of things that we can't tackle on the front end. And they said the same thing. We're able to go in deep. We're able to talk about things we don't talk about in the front end. We're able to talk freely. We're able to answer all questions about the website, talk about the Founders Program and different breeding methods. We don't hold back. And it just made me feel good. The members are appreciating the way we're doing it now. And you know what? The members come first. They do. I got a little bone to pick here. Uh, So our names, we've got Oscar. Frank Bradley is Oscar, which I just found out that that's his nickname back in Kentucky. Everybody knows him by that. But Kenny and me, I get the (laughs) R2-D2, but the AKA Team Psychiatrist. I got it. And here's the thing. When they was going over this back in the green room, <laughs> I just opened up a, a can of soda. Yeah. And when Kenny read that out, I sucked it up my notes. And when I, <laughs> when I did, I had to go get a towel. And they got a good kick out of it. Well, we were talking and I just go, hey, Nancy, have you noticed your new title? And she yeah. reads it. And Frank like, and I go, did you look at mine? And then Frank lost it. Yeah, he right out his nose. <laughs> and, and and really, that's her role with me and Kenny. She yeah. keeps me and Kenny in line on the subject and keep from us just rattling on about breeding or a certain thing. So she's that and a referee, so to speak. I told Frank, I go, you need to say you were cured by Nancy. I'm still her patient, but you're cured, you know. So <laughs> I don't know. I've got a ways to go still yet, Kitty. Yeah, I'm going to change her name on every show. Or I'm going to try to anyways. So I've got I can a, always read I, I sat down, I was watching the movie, The Chosen. And during the different episodes, I was writing down some different things that I can change your name to. So I've got about a dozen different ones I'm going to use. Keep your eye out for that. So oh, Lord. as far as my members are concerned, like I said, the first hour is going to be for the public. The second hour is going to be members only. So when we jump out of here, make sure to go to the website and join us there. We're going to be going a lot more in depth. We have a number of questions that I use on Facebook that we're going to address today on the front end. But I have some members questions on the back end that we had on the members group page. And we'll be addressing those on the back end. And then we can answer your questions there. So it's a lot easier to answer your questions on the back end and the front end because we only have so much time on the front end. So Nancy will pull up relevant questions on the front end. But we're going to be answering most of the questions on the back end. I encourage you to join so that you're getting the whole show. So that's basically it for the announcement, so we can get into the show. As a lot of you know, if you're part of my group's page, especially the members page, I put together questions and I let whoever's on there give me your opinion. 
So I'll ask a question. Sometimes I'll give you some multiple choices and I ask you what you think about it. And then I let the members and the followers give us your opinion, hash it out, let the members and the followers kind of talk with each other about what they think. And then we address it on the show here. I pretty much stay out of it. I don't really get into those. I try to not enter it whatsoever. I don't want to skew anybody. I'll do mine later, but I I do try to stay out of it as much as possible. So we're going to address those questions today. The beauty of that though, Kenny, and what he's talking about. Now he has a Breeders Academy group just for the members. And then he has also on the Master Breeder group, it's members and non-members. So he puts these questions on there to where he gets both sides as far as the non-members versus the members. But uh, usually I don't have to look at the names. Uh, I look at the comments, I follow the comments, and I don't have to look at the names because I know the members versus the non-members just by their comments, usually. Oh, yeah, it's easy to tell. I know most of the members are. I don't know all the members. I know the ones that contact me quite a bit or I see them popping up within the website or on the groups page, so I know them right away. But like Frank said, I can tell by what they say and how they discuss it, whether they're members or not. But the first question was, what's more valuable? And I wanted you to pick the top three. And again, we'll say it over and over again, but I was really proud of the members because they pretty much got it right every time. But it was interesting to see what the non-members said. And I really feel bad because I looked them over as it was going, but I didn't go into actually Facebook and pull off anything And we're just going to have to talk about the best we can, Frank, because I can't draw from what people said because I didn't get around to actually writing an outline. So we're just going to talk about it ourselves. Well, I'll say this. This was a really no sweat whatsoever easy question for the members. I I guarantee you if you went on the members, all the members that commented on that, I bet you there wasn't a wrong answer to the members. No, but the Mm non-members, what do you think was the first one on the top of the list? Performance and production. Yep. yep. Performance and production was number Always. one. Yeah, that was the number one. And then the rest of them were all over the board. I can pick out two for sure. And the third one I wasn't okay, sure of. That's a good point. And I want to say that real quick. Is all my members know that you can't build a breed, no matter how good the quality of their genetics are, how good the quality of the bird you're starting with or how pure they may be or how good their performance and production is. If their health and vigor isn't right, you're not going to create a strain. You're going to fight that all the way through. you got to fix the health and vigor before you can start with anything else because it doesn't give you much options if your good birds are always sick, but your lousy birds are the healthy ones. Okay. So you got to start with really good health and vigor. And then number two, was type and confirmation because if they don't have the right type and confirmation, they don't represent their breed. And color is always usually last because it's the easiest to fix out of most of the colors. Although we can get into the handful of colors that you do need to pay attention to first. But number three, and and this is why Nancy, what she says is really important. Number three can be speculative. It can be different for everybody. So I don't put a lot of emphasis on number three, although health and vigor is number one and confirmation and type is number two. Frank, what do you think about number three? Because everybody has a different opinion. I'm okay with that, actually. Yeah. How many times have you heard this, Kenny? Well, I don't really concentrate on purity of blood because of my age. I can see that somehow. Now, if you'd asked me this 20 years ago, I'd probably answered it just like that. I'd give you a different answer. But now, as far as purity of blood, I see the importance of it. But I could see to where it would vary. I can see that. Mm -hmm. I really can. Now, I do put purity of blood as number three for me. It's because if I'm building a strain and I'm making progress, I'm going to see repeatability. They're going to repeat themselves. They're going to reproduce themselves. I'm going to see predictability so that when I have a bunch of offspring, I'm not going to get a lot of surprise. And then I'm going to see uniformity and consistency. And those are the three criteria of purity of blood, which once you have those three health, vigor, confirmation type, purity of blood, then all the other ones kind of just fall in place. That's how I look at it. But that was the only thing the members I saw, they all got it right. They got health and vigor right as number one, type and confirmation as number two, but they did vary at number three. And I understood that actually. Yeah, I can actually say it, but you took the words right out of my mouth, Kenny, as far as the non-members that was saying performance in production was number one. And 
you hit the nail on the head because if you've got the other three, that's going to match up. That's obvious if you've got the other three going. So that's how I look at it. Yeah, because if you have purity of blood, then the breed characteristics and the traits of the bird all fall into place. You can't have purity of blood without those things. So if you're working on those things, you're improving them as you go, then not only are they going to be pure in blood, but they're going to be predictable. They're going to be repeatable. They can reproduce themselves. They're going to be uniform. Now, one of the reasons purity of blood can be speculative, because you can have a pure family, but they don't reproduce themselves. It it just meant that you never added new blood, but you weren't selectively breeding them either. So you just kept them pure within the family, but you weren't trying to purify the comb. You weren't purifying the color, the leg color, the conformation, the type. You just bred whatever, but you just didn't add new blood. That's why purity of blood can be speculative. Okay, I've got a question for you guys. Sure. I agree with health and vigor, and I agree with type and confirmation totally, but breed characteristics and traits, don't they develop into purity of blood? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was just saying, that Mm -hmm. you can't have purity of blood unless they're proper. Well, no, 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 no. I'm back to where I was saying again. You got me off track. Okay, purity of blood can be looked at two different ways. Their purity of blood in that they repeat themselves, they represent their breed, they have all the traits they should have, or you have some that have purity of blood in that they don't selectively breed, they didn't add new blood, but they're not selectively breeding them, and the traits are all over the place. Um, See, I never think of it like that. I never think of their traits being all over the place because I just automatically assume if they're breeding and they know what they're doing, each offspring is going to be identical to the parent. So I just think that goes hand in hand. And I don't even think that no. it's going to be anything different than that. Frank and I have seen it. Yeah. Frank and I have seen it over and over again yeah. where there's some breeders. They just don't put the effort in to selectively breed them and improve the family. But yet they never added outside blood. It kind of shows the skill of the breeder. It doesn't give the buyer much confidence in his blood. It's hard to believe that they are pure. But uh, yeah, it does create an issue. Absolutely. That's a good comparison, though, Kenny. That's yeah. a really good comparison. Yeah. And temperament, like Barbara's saying, is very important because if you think about it, temperament can almost be right there with health and vigor. Because if you have a family with really poor temperament, really poor behaviors, that's a family It's really hard to work with. The only thing I would say is don't give up on the family just because they have poor temperament because it can be fixed. It's not a simple gene to fix, but it, it's fixed over time. You can never really fix temperament overnight. It's not a monogenic trait. It's not a dominant or recessive. It's basically a polygenic trait, which we consider a multi-gene trait. Polygenic multi-gene traits are what we call quantitative. They're measurable, quantitative being measurable. So if we can select the highest intensity for that trait, we say this all the time. This is like a broken record. But if we can select the offspring that have the best temperament, even though they're not perfect, little by little, we can get there. So it's, it can be fixed. And, and same thing with health and vigor. We can improve a family very well by selectively breeding for the healthiest birds. Absolutely. And it can be done because when I first started on the light reds, the ones I called the roundheads, the cocks would come through the wire on you. Literally, if somebody tied you up and put you in a pen with one, they wouldn't stop hitting you. They, they were that bad of man fighters. And now... I can take one, maybe been in my hand two times, get him out, and he just like puppy dogs. It's all in the selection, how you select the birds as you're breeding them. But uh, I don't stand for that. That's one thing I do not stand for. If I get a bird that's mean like that, he gets cold really, really fast because I don't want nothing like that on my yard. I can't tolerate it anymore. It's all about selective breeding. This is a good point Rob makes, is that health and vigor without type and confirmation is just healthy birds of a different breed or no breed at all. And basically, if they don't have the right type and confirmation, they don't represent their breed. But you still have to have health and vigor because with good health and vigor, you can actually improve your fowl. If they don't represent their breed, you can selectively breed them in a way that they hopefully will in time represent their breed. So it depends how far off they are. If they're just mixed birds with a lot of genetic diversity, you just kept bringing in new blood all the time. They're so messed up, it's not even funny. That's a whole different story. But if they're close and they just weren't selectively bred and improved along the way, they just got off track, then you can bring them back. We say it all the time. It's amazing what's in their genome, just waiting to be selected and exaggerated and improved on over time. And I've seen it many times where the birds were way off. You could see the traits were there. They just weren't proper. They weren't meeting the standard. But over time, 
selecting the right birds and using something like the Founders Program, they were able to get there. That's a key. But health and vigor is number one, and it should always be treated as number one. Yeah, health and vigor, Kenny. Mm -hmm. We always put health and vigor right there with confirmation. They're that important. Would be health, vigor, slash, type, confirmation. Yeah. It's that important. Well, really, it's number one and number one. You know, if you look at the standard, they make type and confirmation number one, which it should right. be. But I always place health and vigor in front of it because even if you have good type and confirmation, if they're sick, it's really tough to create a strain from that. Although the standard doesn't put it in first place, I do. I make it a and, big deal. And, and one point I want to get to the viewers, too, and when, when me and Kenny and Nancy is talking about health and vigor, we're not saying that you can't start with those. It's best to start with birds that are healthy. But now if you've got some that's sick, you can get past that. It's just how long do you want to put that time in them as just far as getting them to where they're healthy. And sometimes it can take quite a while to do that. Yeah. What do we say? Start with the healthiest birds and the best birds you can. Can you create a family? I'm a firm believer you can create a family from any cock and hen, but you make so much more progress. You get there quicker if you start with the best birds possible. Health and vigor, confirmation, and type are there. Color is a factor. Because if you got birds that are way off on color, it's going to take you that much longer to get there. So, yeah, I mean, if you're going to spend a lot of money on birds and you want to create a strain from them, then get the best birds possible. Take your time. Look for the right birds. Do they need to be related? No. You can get a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder, but they have to match each other. They have to be from the same breeding variety. If you're creating birds from different breeds, then you're basically crossing and then you're creating a new breed, which I don't have a problem with. But to take a cross from two different breeds and bring them back to where they should be, that's a lot of work. That's going to take you a long time to get there. Or off-color, gray off -color and Off-color is another one, yeah. Do so, not go that route, I mean, ever. understand your color groups. Can I buy a red bird from one person and a gray bird from another person? Yeah. But what direction are you going to go? If you're going to go to the gray side, you're going to fight a battle. You yeah. may never get there. If you're going to go red, it's going to take you a little work, but you could get there. So understand your color genetics, understand your color groups, and understand when you buy birds that are contrasting, let's say, in color, know what it's going to take to get to the direction you want to go. That's what we teach at the British Academy. This includes comb type. This can include leg color. It can be feather color. But when we're talking about type and conformation, that has to be as right as possible because that's not a monogenic trait, that's a polygenic trait, and it takes a long time to fix. Polygenic traits, you can never just add new blood and fix it overnight. It takes many generations to fix a polygenic trait. Well, Kenny, how many times have we heard this? Confirmation in type doesn't matter. We well, hear, I hear it all the time, which is the craziest get, thing I've ever heard. Now, some may truly believe that, but I think a lot of them say it because they don't understand it. Because if they had an understanding of it, they would know that if you've got the type and confirmation, the legs, the wings, the body is in the correct proportions, then all the rest of it is a guarantee, pretty much. Because a bird that doesn't have his legs, wings, and tail in the correct spot is just a walking anomaly as far as they're not balanced, they're not what they should be. But if they're in the right proportions, everything else is going to come to that birdie. I think it's a combination of not knowing, not caring, and don't think you can get there. True. <laughs> because if they don't think they're breeders, they don't think they can get there, or they don't think it's possible, they don't know how, then they're going to make excuses for why they can't get there, and they're going to try to normalize where they are, and that everybody should think like them. Some people don't know, some people don't care, some people don't want to go through what it takes to get there. So I think it's a combination of all three, which is kind of sad, but a true breeder would understand the value of confirmation of body. It's a must just wonder that some people go with best of the best and that's all the breeding that they need to know about Again, it's, it's just same. that one looks good and that one looks good and hope their luck is with them for that offspring that's well, i think it's misstrewed i think what and that's just said our best to the best it's misstrewed because really in a pure family that's really what you're doing okay in a pure family yeah. in a yeah. pure pure family but now you can't take mongrels and breed the best to the best and accomplish anything, in my opinion. There's a place for best and the best in a true breeding program. But as a general practice only, no, because you're never going to get there. And best of the best is just like confirmation of body. It's the same criteria. They either don't know 
don't care or they don't want to do what it takes to get there. And I think best of the best is the same thing, is that they use it because they don't want to go through the trouble of doing it right. And then they want to normalize it. And then they think everybody else should do it. So they feel normal. So I think it falls in the same category as confirmation of body. What's he saying? To understand the confirmation, you have to study why each breed was created the way they were. Oh, yeah. Every bird has a function and a purpose. We look at the form, function, and beauty of the bird. Every breed has a purpose, and their confirmation represents that purpose. Yeah, because yeah. you don't want American game to have the confirmation of a Rhode Island Red right. or a, a Black Giant or a Silky because they're built for a specific way, and all birds are that way, even wild birds. They are built for their environment, pretty much, and what they do. Yeah. I know Kenny's hurrying to get to the next one, but this is such a great subject. It's like, why spend so much money on getting some seed fowl if you're not going to learn the proper way to breed them? You're just wasting money, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Just don't sell them as pure, okay? And you're going to fall behind because we're actually teaching breeders what to look for and they're going to start questioning you and then you're going to look kind of dumb because you don't know what they know and you're supposed to be the expert. Yeah, it's what it is. We're changing the trend, absolutely. Our followers are gaining, our members are gaining. The knowledge is getting out there and if you're not falling in place, you're going to fall behind. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. This show was brought to you by the Breeders' Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, we'll provide you with the roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. I urge you to check it out. You've got nothing to lose, and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. I hope to see you there. So let's get started. This next one is an interesting one. And I only build these when people ask questions. I go, oh, that makes a good question. So I put it together and then I throw a few, a multiple choice in there. And sometimes it's a trick question, but sometimes I just want to throw some things in there to see what you do with it. And this one was the breeding program known as 5H3s. Is it used for what purpose? So we got enhanced hybrid vigor, creating a strain. To understand the 5H3H method is to understand what it was created. Now, it is a true method. If you go in the old Dead Man books, and they still use it today for the most part, it's a breeding method that was created for cattle for enhancing hybrid vigor to improve meat yields. It was never used to create a strain or to improve a strain because basically what it does is it introduces so much genetic diversity There's no fixation, there's no locking of the genes, there's no uniformity, there's some in and in breeding in there, and you're infusing distant ancestors, so basically you're reintroducing old blood that you should have weeded out through selection in the first place. So all I would tell people is, this one was making the rounds for a while, it's kind of quiet down, I think we exposed it for the most part, and the people that were teaching it realized where they were going with it, although somebody will ask them about it once in a while, and then they got to defend what they said before, and then they try to get out of it as fast as they can. But these kind of things, especially breeding programs, research them, do your homework, and find out what these methods were actually used for, and some of them, they don't exist, or they were created for the wrong reasons. The 5H3, it's of course, but the TRIO method has its issues. And these are things we're going to address eventually. As a matter of fact, I'm working on an outline. We're going to do a little bit on the front end, but most of it's going to be on the back end. If you got a proper breeding program and it's used to create a strain, it should improve the strain each generation. So basically, you're trying to lock and fixate the traits. You're creating uniform and consistency within the traits. And eventually, you're cloning certain birds within the strain. And a good breeding program should have those elements in it. 
I'm thinking that the 583X, it could have been created for a specific function back in the day, but throughout the years, the function and the breeding has gotten misconstrued in no. the communication. Here's what's happened. Some of these people are desperate for a program they can sink their teeth in to f make them feel like they got something to uh, teach their followers. Basically, they're looking for a program that they can show people that they've actually created their own strain and this is what they use. The fact that they're even using 5H38s as a method that they're promoting shows that they don't have a strain. There's no way in hell they're using this method. They're not using yeah. this method at all. No way. They start by crossing them for the hybrid vigor, and then they use this method to enhance the hybrid vigor as they go. Yeah. So if you look at the way it's made up, and I have charts for it, and we'll present it when we actually cover this fully. But you can see the way it's set up. There's nothing showing that they're trying to create a strain. Like I said, there's no fixation of traits. There's no locking of genes. There's no uniformity or consistency being created. There is some in an inbreeding going on there. And they go out of their way to reintroduce old ancestors, which is not the way you create a strain. And they even say it. It's in the description in the program in these old dead man books that it's used to enhance hybrid vigor. So does that sound like creating a strain to you? Not to me. And then they show the programs they do use for creating a strain for cattle. So, and too, Kenny, you're not going to improve them much either through this. It's five, not eight, a, and three, eight. You've got no room for improvement. No, because you can't selectively breed them in a way to do the improvement. When you're improving meat yields, you're just looking for a bigger, better carcass, basically, that holds that's more meat. That's not improving the breed. That's not improving the strain. That's just getting more meat on the bones so that you can market it better. So why these guys thought this was a method to use for actually creating a strain for chickens, I don't think they researched it. I don't think they looked it over very well. They just saw that you do this, you do that, you do this over here, and then you bring them together. Well, all you did was mongrelize them. You hybridize them, then you mongrelize them, then you brought them together. You didn't create anything. And then you're holding aunts or uncles on the side, which could prove later not to be worth anything anyways, and hoping that they're going to work out. I mean, the whole method just doesn't work for chickens at all. So Jason's asking, could you use it in an established strain? No, it actually ruins an established strain. You're okay. going forward, and then you're adding old blood back in, and it ruins the whole thing. Just look at the way the Founders Program is set up. If there's a seed fowl stage. There's a transformation stage, and then there's a foundation stage. Where in those three stages would you use a program like this? You, you wouldn't. Can't. No. And then there's a rotation stage. This isn't even a rotation stage. So it goes totally against what we do as far as the founders program in that you're creating a strain, you're improving a strain, then you're maintaining a strain. There's parts to where you start to get them a little bit better, and then you add the original old blood right back into it, and that's shooting yourself in the foot right there with any pure strain. So let me pull up the next one. This is interesting. This, this is was the one that I was wanting to see the non-members answer. Yeah. This was the one I was waiting for. I, I tell Kenny just about every day, you need to put this one on there. You need to put this one on there. Yeah, I hope we get it in within an hour. I have more for the members on the back end, so no worries there. But I have two more, this one and another one, that I really want to cover on the front end. Then we can move to the back end. All right. So how often should you add outside blood okay. and why? Now, I was so proud of the members. This should be a no-brainer, especially if you're yeah. following me for all these years. Okay. So the members had it right on. And the non-members were, like, questioning, why wouldn't you add new blood? What's the problems of adding new blood? It was kind of weird. There was a few people that gave an opinion why it was a good idea to add new blood. But many of the non-members had a question like, why wouldn't you? I don't get it. Why wouldn't you? And then the members were like, never, never, never across the board. So I kind of wish I would have wrote an outline on the responses we got on this particular banner because the members, a lot of them said never, but a lot of them gave explanation too. And I wish I would have kind of grabbed a few of those. But uh, Well, I have one that contacted me through Facebook. And he said, is that a trick question? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and there is one time that we recommend that you can't add blood. And that's at the very beginning. Yeah. And that's the only time. And that's what he was asking. He said, I heard you and Kenny always say if he was at the beginning, uh, you could add blood at that time. But that's the only time. And Kenny's 
question on the outside blood and why, he was just more or less asking to see if he was right about it. And I said, yeah, you're 100% right. Yeah, but that's the first stage. Exactly. There's seven stages within the Founders Program. You can't move on to the second stage until you stop adding new blood. It's like evolution. You look at gene flow. Every time new genetics comes into our strain, you're changing that strain each time. You're recombinating the genes. You're changing it. A strain doesn't emerge from that until the flow of genes actually stops. Then, whether it's the environment, which dictates which traits actually survive, or whether we selectively breed them as breeders, eventually the strain or the species become more and more uniform to survive their environment or to suit our purposes, and the strain evolves from that. But every time you add new blood, you completely change that family. Not just a little bit. You're not just changing a little here and there. You completely change them, and you're starting over. So a proper breeding program would never add outside blood, not without using some kind of a program like a subline. Well, you're 100% right, Kenny, because whatever your strain is, you add outside blood to it, that strain is gone forever. Unless you set it up in a subline, we'll, yeah. we won't go into that. But unless you use the insurance policy, those birds are gone forever, never yeah. to return. Yeah, never mess up your foundation line. When you add new blood, not only changing the breed, you're not only recombining the genes, and we know that happens through meiosis and the crossover event and the way the gametes are uniquely created, but you're adding undesirable traits and unwanted recessives. You're adding detrimental genes, which could include lethal genes. Now, these don't sound like a big deal to some people, but they're actually a big deal. Okay, so once you add blood into a family that you think is fairly established, you've changed it forever. I can just imagine the pit in the middle of your stomach when you realize you made a mistake and now you got to start out completely over and selectively breed them into something. And will they be what they were? Nope. They're going to be completely different than they were. They're going to be a completely different strain. And you can't and breed future. it back out. Yeah, that's there the problem. There you go. You can't mm -hmm. breed it back out. Denny is saying that this is what we were taught in the late 80s by old breeders around South Louisiana. It makes sense now. Always wondered as a kid why we couldn't get more than one generation of decent fowl. Because... You have this family of fowl. You started to make progress. They were starting to look good. You got scared, so you probably had new blood to avoid inbreeding depression. So now you added the blood. You got hybrid vigor. The birds seem to be better than they were, and hybrid vigor does do that. It creates offspring that are bigger, better, faster, stronger, smarter than the parents, which is usually a huge bump in vigor which is expresses itself in the phenotype, like ways you never imagine, which makes it like, oh my God, I got the greatest strain ever. So then you start breeding nose, and because you can't reproduce or maintain hybrid vigor, they completely fall, and then you get unpredictability on top of that, and the quality goes down, and you're like, okay, I must have messed up, let me add new blood. So you get a certain amount of hybrid vigor after that, not the complete hybrid vigor you would have got if they were pure, but it seems like some kind of improvement. You go a year or two, they seem like they're better, then again they fall down. It's a hamster wheel you'll never recover from. You'll never make progress. I say create a strain, improve them along the way, and you'll improve all the traits that you desire, all the traits you're looking for, all the traits you're trying to perpetuate. Over time, they improve gradually. And the biggest indication is, are the offspring better than the parents? You know you're moving in the right direction. But as soon as you add new blood, recombinate the genes and change them forever. Well, I got one thing, Kenny. Hmm. I don't know if you remember this or not. And I know we're hurting on time, but I think this needs to be addressed. On this one here, I sent you a screenshot of a pic. And it says, okay, Kenny, I know you say never add blood, but you added a jumper hen to your bloodline. No, so I didn't. So you're infusing blood. No, I didn't. Okay, so but I'm going to explain I, I that. I want you to explain that because so, that was one of the questions. That's very important. I have my Maximus line. That has never changed. I've never added outside blood to that. So I want to create, and if you have a pure family, a good foundation, you can create a lot of different strengths off that foundation. I'm not saying mm -hmm. adding to that foundation. I'm saying you can create new strains from that main foundations that are separate from that one, and that's what I did. So I grabbed one of my best Maximus birds. I got a really good jumper hen. And I create a whole separate line. I bred that Maximus cock to that jumper hen. That was my Adam and my Eve, my seed fowl. I took the offspring from there, 
and I moved, almost said it, Frank. <laughs> I moved on using the Founders Program, never using that jumper hen ever again. I created a, a separate strain from that, and that now is my single rail line. Thanks. But it's a great line. I saw that, matter of fact. I'm glad mm-hmm. you brought that up. I did not add a jumper hen to my foundation strain. I created a whole new strain using that jumper hen one time. And that's the reason we say never use the name game for when you're breeding chickens, okay? Me and Kenny don't see it as a jumper to hatch, okay? You put those two birds together to make your own strain. doesn't matter what they are. Take the name equation out of it. You pick those birds for your main primary, and then you're going on set a new strain, going through a program with it. But a lot of people see that, oh, well, that's a cross. Those birds will never be pure because they're half jumper and half this. They look at it totally different. That's the reason the names needs to be taken off of where we can breed with our eyes and our ears rather than names. You see it all the time. This is a hatch and a sweater. Cross. Okay, great. You got a cross. Probably a mongrel for all we know. There's probably more in it than you think. Good looking bird? A lot of times no, but let's say it's a good looking bird. Well, what are you going to do with that? Because unless you're going to run it through a proper breeding program with a proper mate, you're not going to do anything with it because if you just keep adding that and adding other birds to it, you went from hybridization to mongrelization and uh, you're just adding blood on top of blood on top of blood and you don't know what you got and you don't know what to do with it. What do you say, Frank? A lion hog can find an acre every once in a while. There you go. And that's what <laughs> yeah. happens when you do crosses. And you might get a good one now and then, but what you do with it after that is what counts. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah, I, I wanted to get that question. I almost let it slip by. Oh, I'm and so glad you I finally that. remembered it. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I do remember seeing that. And I did want to address it. I did want to go in there and jump in there. I said, nope, stand back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we'll get to that on the show. We didn't want to ruin anything. Yeah, we've almost jumped into the founders program a couple of times here. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you know what's going to happen? Just so you guys know, and I'll do this too. If I jump into the founders program and I say the wrong thing, the recording stops. I jump into YouTube and I erase the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, fast. You had me scared there a little while ago, though, but you caught yourself. Yeah, I did catch oh. myself. Boy, I went right into it, didn't I? So, yeah, you almost said it. I mean, you was right on that. I, I already have plans. It happens. If I say the wrong thing or pop up this <laughs> the wrong thing on the screen, you better have been paying attention because it's going to be gone within 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would have been a bad one, too. Yeah. I think sometimes you forget you're not in the back end. Yeah. It's hard. So. Well, yeah. I'm trying to go Nancy so f- knows. It's difficult. It's really yeah, difficult. And then when we go over to the members, we got to remind ourselves, then we can say things what we yeah. want to say. Frank, what happens? Look how okay. fast we're going. Okay. And we're trying to get in a lot in, in a little bit of time. What happens when we go in the back end? It's like, whew, yeah, we just settle down. It's calm. It's collected. It's like your home. We're, yeah, it's like we're just sitting around with friends and the whole mood changes. It's so yeah. great. <laughs> it's like you went to a banquet where everybody's uh, got their nice clothes on and then you come home and you throw the sweats on and the t-shirt and you get in your recliner type feeling. It's like I'm at the seminar and I'm promoting. We walk in the next room with family and friends and we go, ah, okay, let's relax. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Let me get this out because we got to keep moving. One more thing. Uh, I got to say this. That's what's nice about the membership. They do feel like family and friends, don't they? They do. do. It feels like family and friends. They are. Yeah. They're totally. Okay. I've got to get this out here because I have something else I want to post too. Keep your line solid. If you want to try something new, make a subline. If it doesn't work, then you can toss it out. What are your thoughts? We'll and talk, I, I know we'll you're going to We'll talk about that on the that back one. end. That's one of our okay. topics we're going to cover on the back end. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So let me pull this up. And before you get to that, let me just post this real quick. Because Robbie's saying, honestly, the Breeders Academy is the only only hope for consistency for most people short of what I would guess to be around 185 IQ with access to what Kenny knows like the back of his hand. <laughs> so, and then he says, all of you that didn't join really messed up. <laughs> so, I appreciate that, got Robbie. That, they, they can get the next go around, though. They will. All I'll say is Join the newsletter. Go to www.breedersacademy.com. Join the newsletter, and it'll be the best thing you did. Trust me on that. Okay? Absolutely. I appreciate that, Denny. Very glad I joined. I appreciate that, Denny. Okay. 
So this one will be the last one for this show. We're doing pretty good, actually. We can wrap this one up pretty quickly. So which one is the most detrimental to a strain? Now, this is me being a little facetious. Almost everybody got this. But the ones that were not members didn't like it, <laughs> you know. It's really everybody's personal opinion, really, yeah. what, which one is most. There but there is an order to this, but sure everybody got it right. It's basically you got defects, disease, genetic contamination, medications, and lack of knowledge. Okay, so if you have the proper knowledge and you're educated in the breeding and the raising and the maintenance of and the husbandry of chickens, game fowl, whatever you decide you're going to raise, then this is a non-issue. You already know all this because you're ready to go. But let's say the game fowl industry, I'm seeing this in the domestic chicken industry too, more than I ever thought I would actually. But this has been a, I want to say an epidemic when it comes to the game fowl industry and in that it's just directed by, I know I'm using the wrong words, by old wise self superstition, if you want to even use the word folklore, whatever. Okay. And people are using these things, they're repeating them, they're teaching other people, and they don't really know why. So the kind of things that are detrimental to a strain, it's different for everybody, but they're all important. And I want to put defects as the top, because if you have a defect and you perpetuate a defect, you're basically ruining your strain because once you get a defect, they are recessive. They will repeat themselves. Before you know it, the whole strain has it. And a lot of times you have to start all over just to get rid of it or go through some fancy breeding. I can show you how to do that to actually improve them and fix them. But it's not a 100% fix. But that's not detrimental either in that if you look at all the de defects that exist, I've seen every one of them in my Maximus line. You just got to know what to do about it so they don't express themselves. So before I go through the rest, what do you think, Frank? Knowledge is everything. If you've got the knowledge, everything else is out of the picture. I'll give you an example, Kenny. Back when I was working at the dealerships, there was this particular Pontiac car that paid eight hours to replace the alternator. It was down on the bottom of the engine in the front. And GM give you what you had to take off and get loose and then put it back together again. And the way they had it, it did take you 8 to 12 hours to do it. But I found a way to where you could go underneath the vehicle, take the wheel off, take one mount loose, jack the engine up, remove the alternator in less than two hours. Now, knowledge, where I've done so many, I found a better way to do that rather than going the long route. The same way here. If you don't have the knowledge, you're going to be fighting everything that you run up on. But if you've got the knowledge, it makes everything so much more easier. You wouldn't do these other things if you had the knowledge, okay? Right. But I do want to tackle some of these other things. Like, we just tackled defects. Genetic contamination. Obviously, if you have an established strain and you add new blood, you've contaminated the bloodline, you've screwed them up. Okay, that's detrimental to the strain. You're basically starting over. It's going to take years of selective breeding, using a proper breeding program, that is, to get them not where they were, but to get them to where they're good again, Okay. And then disease and medications kind of go hand in hand. Now, if you're culling and selecting birds that are well and you're culling the sick birds, then in time you're going to have a nice strain. But if you're just hiding it with medications, which is what I see most of the time, we've heard it how many times? I have really good chickens because I have really good medications. How many times have I heard that? That's crazy. They have talk. healthy fowl because okay. they got good medications. And you know yeah. what's funny? Is the same people were complaining the other day that they've been trying all these different medications. Nothing's working. Why is it not working? Because the birds are becoming resistant to the medications that they're using the they to fix the disease. And mm -hmm. they're probably using the wrong medications or they're using different medications with the same active ingredient, not knowing they're using the same medication over and over again. Just get rid of the medications. Start selectively breeding for the healthy ones and cull the sick ones. It's going to feel really bad in the beginning because you're going to be calling a lot of birds, but eventually you're going to get there. How many members have we've talked to that said they trusted in our judgment? It was hard. They were scared. They just said, okay, Kenny, I'm trusting you. And they get back to me a few years later and go, bad. it was the best thing I ever did. I got rid of the sick chickens, bred to the healthy ones. And we're talking about but now coccidiosis and worms and coryza, <laughs> all those, you know? Yeah. I've had a lot of people, Kenny, they would do that. They'd put their foot down and say, I'm going to do this. And as soon as they started seeing signs that they were getting better, they'd introduce new birds or not do their biosecurity, let people come in on their farm. 
You can't have healthy fowl and still bring outside birds on your place. You can't do it because you're just bringing new diseases and whatever have you. The best way to do is what birds there is born there. And if you stick with that and you select a healthier and cool to sick, you'll see it's well worth it. I promise. Biosecurity. I've talked to Dr. Gallardo a number of times about it. And he says once he starts talking about biosecurity, their eyes roll behind their head and all of this again. And they don't want to hear it. They don't want to deal with it. It's not important to them. It's not the way they do things. But it's actually very important. Now, if you think you're going to rely on medication, the thing is it doesn't really fix anything. It hides it, and it's always chronic. So you're better off selecting for it. So keep a closed yard. Use really good biosecurity. Try to keep things as clean as you can without overdoing it. Get away from the medications, and you're going to get there. One of the things I'm going to be working on is the outline for the program on disease resistance, improving your disease resistance. It's one I can't wait to get to. It just got so big. We kept getting more and more information. I'm like, okay. I need to take some time with this one because I want to make sure it's right. So, Or we could just do this. Please say, just give them a little NyQuil and the chickens will be brand new in the morning. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Kenny and Nancy, this is how a lot of people see it. They give the chickens medicine. The chickens get better. They don't see that chicken as being sick anymore. But in reality, that chicken is just as sick, just the biggest carrier as it was while it was sick. You just give it medicines to where it's not showing the symptoms of the disease. But you let that chicken get under stress and watch it get sick again. Every time it gets under stress, the immune system goes down a little bit, that's going to come out in it. And if you want to know if you've got disease on your yard, stress your chickens. Whole feed for a day or so, stress them out a little bit, and whatever diseases you've got on your yard, you're going to find out real fast what you've got. Yeah. Now, one of the things I've been hit with by members and followers the last few days which I was like, geez, what's going on here? Don't know why. Didn't really look into it this time. But I kind of have an idea where it may have came from is copper sulfate. I lost count how many times someone asked me about copper sulfate. And Dr. Gallardo and myself talked about it a little bit. Matter of fact, we've covered internal and external parasites. I think we talked about it both times. That time we did one on worms again, and he talked about it then. So there's a number of times we've talked about it. Now, I grabbed a little piece of one of the videos we did, and I put it on Facebook, YouTube. Well, it's on Facebook, too. And you can check it out, what he said, what he thinks about using copper sulfate. And I'll say this. It's a stringent chemical. It's not really medication. It burns the inside of the bird. Now, he says it will kill like coccidiosis, but the problem is it kills everything. It does damage to the intestines, the inner lining, necrotic enteritis on top of that. So he was saying the things that it would cause would be way bigger than anything that the coccidiosis would do it. And here's the other thing too. These guys believe that you need to kill all the worms, that you need to kill all the coccidia, You need a certain amount of worms in there to build proper immunity, okay? You need a certain amount of coccidia in the body to keep them healthy and immune and and resistant to the effects of coccidiosis. Coccidiosis is actually the disease. Coccidia is the bug, which they need because it's ubiquitous everywhere. We have it in our bodies. All animals have it. Our chickens have it. The idea of using copper sulfate as a program every so many weeks or months to control worms and coccidia is crazy because you don't want to eliminate all those things all the time. You need to let that build up and let them build immunity to it. And the only reason you'd want to kill or actually knock down the effects of coccidiosis is if you're actually seeing the effects of coccidiosis. And most of the time we see it in young birds, not older, mature birds usually. And they're giving this to all their birds. The detriments of using copper sulfate on young birds is even worse than using on old birds, and they're giving it to birds that aren't even showing symptoms of coccidiosis. So we're going to cover this, Frank and I. We're going to be doing uh, nutrition here pretty soon, and copper sulfate is going to be either a portion of one show or maybe even a whole show because I think it's that important. Yeah, we're going to bring the awareness of copper sulfate. Now, copper sulfate is in pretty much all the dog yeah. food and all the but chicken trace food that you get. elements of it. 100 per million, okay? I mean, we're talking about just dust, just a little bit of it. And a lot of times the reason they put that in there is protect the feed more than for the chickens. Yeah. 
I mean, they but use we'll it. Get into it. Yeah. So we'll, I don't want to get too deep into it. I've been getting a lot of questions about it. What I did is I put a little banner on Facebook, get how they feel about it, see where my members and my followers were. And then I saw some arguments about copper sulfate between some of the followers. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to grab that little piece of Dr. Guy or I'll put it on there. Maybe that'll answer some of the questions. But I knew Frank and I were going to dig deep into that one. So, you But know. I will say this, Kenny. The people that's done on a regiment, they're killing their birds slowly. I think so, or too. Really not slowly. Because when you're doing it on a regiment, that should be only on a half two measures only, giving it by mouth, okay? That should be only a half two. Think about it this way. Most of the disease, most of the health of the bird is controlled by the gut, okay? So if you have an unhealthy gut, which doesn't have a certain amount of worms to build that immunity, it doesn't have the certain amount of coccidia in there to build the immunity, and you're disrupting it with something like copper sulfate, so you're burning it, you're creating other problems, that's not a healthy gut. So what's gonna happen? All those other diseases that they're worried about are gonna come into play and they're not going to understand why they're not able to control the diseases because they're actually disrupting the gut all the time. So let the gut do its thing. The gut knows what to do. It's going to control most of the things that they're exposed to on the farm. When they show symptoms, and maybe you do something then, but not as a program, not as something you do every so many months. No. No. And they've got to realize, like Kenny said, it kills everything. It kills, it all kills the good everything. bacteria kills all the worms and anybody that has studied the immune system the immune system is only going to build against the pathogens that it's aware of. that's exactly if, it, if it's raced out they'll never be tolerable to it because there's nothing there for them to tolerate so, so if you don't let them build that immunity and you're always disrupting the gut and you're killing the good bacteria you're killing the, all the worms you're killing the coccidia then you have to keep doing that all the time and then as you're doing that, the guts always disrupt it. So it lets in issues with other diseases, too, because it's not able to fight those either. The gut it, is so important. And they're not even giving them a probiotic after they're doing this well, regimen. Even no, if they even did, worse. it's not enough. They still, it's not enough. You, you know no. how hard it is to get the good probiotics in there to do the job? That, it takes months. So just when, let's, say they, let's say they give the probiotics. It's not a proper probiotic program where they're giving it every day for a month or two. Let's say they even did that, okay? And then what, two or three months again, they're giving the copper sulfate again and killing all they built up again? That's right, and I don't believe in the regiment. No. I don't believe in a worming regimen either. No. So we can talk Especially if your birds is not wormy. No. <laughs> if they feel good, they're active, don't worm them. Usually if they Those got wormers. Those wormers are bad as the copper sulfate. Yeah. Some of them's even probably worse. And copper sulfate in a large dose is, well, we already said it, Kenny. Take and put you a, a eighth of a teaspoon in a metal pan and fill it up for water and go out about a month and look at your pan. Oh, it won't God. have any water in it. It will be eat up with rust. Yep. It will eat a hole through it. So if you're doing a regimen on that, think of the tissue damage that you're doing to that chicken. If you're doing it every three months, every two months, whatever you're doing, think of the damage that's doing. Okay. Take it a step farther. Give them the copper sulfate in a metal bowl. You're killing your chickens even yeah, faster. Metal. <laughs> you're poisoning your chickens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can I say something here? I was going to give you your time. <laughs> uh, hey, t- Nancy, we're just, we're just so excited. I'm sorry. I, I could see her wanting to get in, but I've got this all in my mind. I want to get it out as fast as I can. <laughs> Wouldn't it be best to start with a healthy gut, concentrating on keeping your chicken's guts healthy. That's your immune system. Yeah, from the time they come out of the shell. Instead of giving them all this crap to get rid of the worms, concentrate on keeping a healthy gut, and then you won't have all these other problems. Right. Nancy, you give me a healthy chicken that's been born out on free range, okay? Never had no medicines, feed, and fresh water is all it's had. And you give me the best chickens in the world that's been raised on medications, and I'm going to take the one that's never had anything over it every time. Breed for health. You're going to have healthy chickens. Use medications and chemicals. You're going to hide the weaknesses, or you're going to kill the chicken slowly, like Frank said. And what we talked about earlier, a chicken immune system can only protect itself if it has built up to those pathogens. That's the reason I could take my chickens on Kenny's farm, Kenny's chickens on my farm, 
they could break down and get sick because my chickens have grown resistance to diseases. And I promise you, on every farm, there's diseases. The chickens are tolerable to it because their immune system is built up to it. Yeah, so if anybody's promoting chemicals or medications, then hopefully It's you, tough. Yeah, don't. It's tough breeding chickens with Good luck to you. In there. Okay. That's all yeah. we Good can say is you. good so, luck yeah. to you. So we're getting ready to go in the back end. We went way over, but I just wanted to cover this for the non-members because it was on Facebook for the public. For some of you, if you're interested in becoming a Breeders Academy member, just go to www.breedersacademy.com. It'll be the best thing you ever did. For our members, join us in the back end, and we'll continue with the show. Anything you guys want to say before we go to the back end? Oh, yeah. The ones I've got coaching calls with already scheduled, we're still on for it. That didn't change anything on my end. I'll still be doing them with you guys. So Okay. Anything else? Okay. I got something to say. It's really important to join that newsletter because that way you will be kept informed about what's coming up with the Breeders Academy. And also like, share, and subscribe. Share often. It really helps with our algorithms and gets the word out there about the Breeders Academy and the Bread Perfection Live. So if you're not already listening to the podcast side of it, you can get there in a number of ways. You can go to the free website, which is www.breedersacademy.com. You'll see the banners for the various platforms for the podcast side of it. You could also go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. We're on everywhere. You're on all of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? See you all on the back side. Okay. See you guys see there. That. Thanks for showing up, you guys. Okay, thanks for listening. Yes, thank you again for joining us on the Breck Perfection Podcast Show. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where by becoming a member, you can increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and take you and your fowl to the next level. We can also show you how to create a strain from hybrid crosses or mongrel flocks and help you to create, maintain, and improve your present strains. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel anytime. To join us at the Breeders Academy membership website, go to www.breedersacademy.com. Best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. While you're checking out the Breeders Academy, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, The Breeders Bulletin. We provide a lot of free bonus materials and some great information that will take you and your fowl to the next level. Well, that's it for now. We hope you join us next time for another episode of Bread to Perfection. We'll see you later. Bye.